All right, welcome Dana Vasali. Thank you so much for um, bringing another wonderful program to Met How at Home. This is sponsored in part by Met How at Home and the Met How Naturalist, which is uh, a journal that Dana started 25 years ago. And the hundredth issue is coming out this winter. So. Thanks so much, Dana, for continually educating us. And it's great to see all these participants joining. And with that, I will pass it to you. Thanks, Tracy. Let me know if there's any glitches, like you can't hear me or anything. And uh, thanks to participants who have signed up. I think uh, I, I was glad to think of doing this mini series on natural history because it's, it's our world. It's the world outside our, the walls of our houses and it's magical and wonderful and a great thing to talk about, especially at times like this when uh, we're staying home more than we want to. <laughs> um, so a couple of uh, introductory comments. One is that for one thing, you're definitely not gonna learn a lot of flowers of the Medhow Valley in this program. That's sort of not what it's about. It could have been, but you wouldn't remember them because you know once you get up to about five plants, you can't remember the sixth one anyhow in a row. You know it's a slow process, and this is this is more about uh, there's something going on out there that is much bigger than us. And I think in my mind it helps with uh, the challenges of this time and any time that there's something going on around here. Uh, and, and it's the evolutionary journey of life and we're a part of it. And a couple of, so many statements that summarize what I think this slide show is about. One is, this is uh, um, Yogi Bear. You can see a lot just by looking. <laughs> That's all there is to it is we're just, you know, life is a process of waking up to the world around us and, and it's infinitely intricate and you can see a lot just by looking. I mean, I have started, you know, I like to look at birds and I would identify them and stop looking. And now I just want to, now sometimes I just want to watch the bird. I'm not done when I realize that it's a black capped chickadee. You know, I, I want to sort of watch it and see what's up to it. It's alive. It's, it's remarkable. Um, it's, I think this kind of information, it's, it's, you can't remember this stuff. It's just too many, you know, there's too many facts in life, there's too many plants. I'm going to tell you how many plants are. There's far too many, even the Met have. It's more a state of mind. It's more a feeling that there's something very special going on and that we're alive and we get to participate in it. I think that would be much more the point of any of these biological programs than learning facts. And I think I want to say that. And so, for example, here we're talking about the floor of the Met How, but the evolutionary journey of the floor of the Met How. This plant is called Steer's Head. And I suppose the joke is it evolved to look like a cow to scare predators herbivores away but of course that is a joke and it's not true but it does look like a cow <laughs> and it's fairly it's not uncommon in the met how but it's a spring flower and it's hard to find um it's only here and there but it, it is it's under it's it's under bitter brush it can be found and i you know email me if you want, want to know some places to look for it uh but it's a nice representative of how complex floral biology is and um what goes on with this is there's those two those are petals that make the horns and then next to the horn sort of touching the horns there's a little nodule two nodules and those are the nectaries so that means that's where the insect which happens this happens to be pollinated by bumblebees and bumblebees are the world's best pollinators they're going to stick their tongue they're going to stand on the nose and stick their tongue in that hole <laughs> and go after. And when they do that, the nose, they, they push with their foot as they stick their nose in there and the nose splits apart and the anthers come out and hit the bee on the belly and the, be and the, bee, get, and the bee gets pollinated. 
uh, automatically by the flower. I mean, it's, it's just astonishing that something like that could evolve. Furthermore, pollinated by bumblebees, the seed has, the seed has a little appendage on it called an aril, A-R-I-L, that's edible by ants. So the ants pick up the seeds and carry them to their nest, which is underground, and pull the arrow off and eat it. And they leave the seed underground. So they plant the seed. This ants plant the seed. <laughs> and it's the plant that got the ant, got the animal to act the way they wanted to, just like it did with the bumblebee. And there is a butterfly called a Parnassian, which is a kind of a white butterfly with has little red spots on the hind wing tips. The leaves turn out to be edible. I didn't really remember that until recently, but the leaves are, I mean, excuse me, the leaves are poisonous. The, the butterfly, the caterpillar eats the leaves and becomes toxic and packs the toxin onto the white butterfly, which has red spots on the wings to warn predators that it is toxic. So all of that goes on with this flower that we can't find because it's so small and it hides under bushes. There's really the, the last slide says that the purpose of evolution, there's a, um, it's Tillier de Chardin, I forget it exactly, but it's a, a world in which uh, ever, in, ever in, improving eyes in which there's ever more to see. Purpose, he, as he says, the purpose of evolution, ever more perfect eyes in a world in which there's ever more to see. It's poetic license, but it's also true. So just briefly, parts of a flower. Uh, we don't really need to know this, but it doesn't hurt, so can you remember those? And if you can't, I've labeled them. So we know those are petals. We may know that the little green things down below are sepals. And then there's uh, this, this outer uh, row of male reproductive structures. Let's see what comes up here. Yeah, the filament and the anther, the anther of the pollen comes out and those are together called the stamen. And in the middle of most flowers is a female reproductive structure called a pistil, made up of the ovary and the style and the stigma. Okay, now clear your desks. We're going to have a test. What is that structure down in the bottom right? I'm just kidding. It's a petal, of course. But the actual, so we remember, at least vaguely, that flowers, the astonishing thing is there are 300,000 species of flowers on the planet. And they're all different or they wouldn't be a different species and so that simple structure that we just looked at there's 300,000 variations on that theme um, and an interesting point in my mind and it's this is something I've had to talk to myself about and I might have said this last week but it comes up more with life than with rocks life adores variability and look how hard it is for us to accept differences and variations in how in, in ourselves in, in human beings we struggle with it life just adores it it's just constantly striving for for variability yeah, and I think flowers certainly illustrate that so this is just an interesting exercise to get a sense of um, the evolution of plants so what we're going to do is condense the 4.8 billion years of evolution of the of the existence of the of the planet into one year so that each month is 400 million years and we're going to locate when did so i have circles that are going to appear and the first one is when life appeared and life did not immediately appear on the planet and there's a circle on april 1st so it took a while life had, the planet had to cool it was molten now to tell you the truth if i'd have thought about it i might we don't know for sure about these things these are you know intricate biological sleuthing to look for fossil records of the first uh, bacterial organisms in rocks that are four billion years old it's not easy but i think this would be moved actually over towards february at this point uh, so the next thing that's going to appear which i think is july 1st is photosynthesis we're going to talk a little bit about photosynthesis further on in the slideshow but photosynthesis is a big deal. I don't know what you had for breakfast, but it was a product of photosynthesis. There would be almost no food on the planet without photosynthesis. Plants are making food out of carbon dioxide and water using the energy of the sun, and all the biomass on the planet is a product of photosynthesis. So a famous 
biologist, not famous enough, Lynn Margulis, and it's funny, she's most famous for being Carl Sagan's ex-wife, because everybody knows who Carl Sagan is. I don't know if it's because she's a woman. She's one of the most famous biologists ever, Lynn Margulis. She did die, I think, in 2008. She said, photosynthesis is the single most important metabolic invention in the history of life. It's a big deal. Yeah, but so it appeared early and there were no plants. It was in bacteria. Remember there are bacteria called cyanobacteria, blue-green bacteria. They're green because they, they're photosynthesizers. They do this trick of photosynthesis, the first plants. So this program's on plants. Well, most of the history of the planet, there were no plants. December 1st, in this condensation, plants appeared 400 million years ago, 425 million years ago. That's when plants appeared. So that means there was almost no life on land. There, there can't be animals. There's no animals if there's no plants. So for most of the history of life on Earth, there was no life on land. And now, I think the number is 97% of the biomass on the planet, of all the biomass, so everything in the oceans and everything on land and maybe a little bit in the atmosphere, 97% is on land. Almost all the life on the planet is on land. So this was quite an innovation and it was not easy. It took most of the history of life to learn how to live on land. And let's see, I think those are flowering plants on December 21st. There were no, there were plants 400 million years ago. Flowers are only about hundred million years old. There were no flowering plants. There were other kinds of plants. We're gonna talk about them. And then humans, well, humans didn't show up there. Humans, of course, what in, you know, I got the numbers from elsewhere, but in this scheme if in which a 4.8 billion years is in one month, a, li a human lifespan would be half a second. So it would start now and end now. <laughs> that would be it. Not a, lot of, not a lot of life. And that's, you know, it seems long to us, but it's a blip. This is a picture of McMurdo Sound in Antarctica and it has almost no plant life. And so I use it to show what just what uh, the planet might have looked like before there were plants. And to some degree, Antarctica reiterates, recapitulates the uh, colonization of land by plants because there are only two flowering plants in all of Antarctica. Um, one of them's a grass, which grasses are flowering plants. They aren't showy because they're wind pollinated, so they don't need to attract insects, but they are flowering plants. And the other one is uh, a little <laughs> yellow flower. So there's 300 species of, I think there's 300 species of lichen and 100 species of moss. So it's colonized, but it's colonized by these tough little organisms that don't need as many nutrients as flowering plants need. The colonization of land by plants is also repeated after every ice age. I showed this picture last week. It's a picture of Silver Star and um, um, Gardner during the last ice age that I took. That's a joke, you know. That's what it looks like. It looks like Silver Star and Gardner. This is what the Methow looked like. 18, 18 17,000 years ago, there was a mile of ice. Everything but the tallest peaks in the Manhattan were covered. Recently, 18,000 years ago, the ice melted 14,000 years ago, 13,000 years ago. There were no plants. Everything had to recolonize the Manhattan Valley, probably starting with lichens on the rocks. Lichens are not plants, but then mosses, the little plants that can dry out. So this process repeats itself because there will be another ice age. You know, with these ice ages, they're thought to have been 15 to 20 in the last two million years. They repeat constantly. So there will probably will be another one. This is the sisters in Oregon. And I, uh, it's a picture I took just, uh, it shows what it looks like when the ice melts. This was recently covered by a glacier and now there's no glacier and there's no life. Life has to recolonize and it's such an interesting journey that this biologist wrote a book about it, Canadian ecologist actually, Pailu, and it's a great book but it's about this story. How on earth did plants get back into the Methow Valley? They don't have legs and they don't have wings. So it's interesting to ponder. And she lays it out in that book. You can write down that title if you are interested. So lichens, these are lichens in the Methow. And this is something we just want to look at. So we, what are the organisms 
we're talking about plants. What are the plant, what kind of numbers do we have? What kind of plant groups do we have in the Met How? Well, okay, lichens are not plants, but they are photosynthetic. Uh, and that is because they are a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and an algae. And you remember learning in third grade that a fungus took a lichen to an algae and they formed a symbiotic relationship. So we're looking at the fungus on these three different species, which are common methouse species. But if you were to break off a tiny little, especially the lower one, that shield lichen, you know, something you can grab a hold of and break it and look at it with a hand lens, you would see a thin green layer where it has a community of algae photosynthesizing, supplying the sugar, because that's what photosynthesis does. It makes sugar out of carbon dioxide and water, supplying the food to the fungus. The fungus uses that to actually construct the body of the fungus and gives the algae a place to live, symbiotic. I think it will come out more in the fourth program that there are themes that emerge from the journey of life on earth. And one of those themes is complexity. Life has definitely unarguably gotten more complex over time. And it also has gotten more symbiotic. And I think, you know, we can find meaning and hope in that, that life is a journey of learning how to work together. Are we struggling to work together right now? Yes. Uh, so what about this? Um, just an interesting little story about that map lichen. That map lichen was taken into space on a space journey and, and exposed outside the space capsule for 15 days where the temperature is 450 degrees below zero and the cosmic radiation would kill most living things, brought back into the cape capsule and brought back to Earth and it was completely unaffected. So lichens are incredibly tough. Of course, they can dry out for, I would say, years. They're going to whatever rock they're on, they're, gonna, they're probably going to be covered with snow. They're going to uh, dry out. They're unaffected. They are living organisms. But they're not. So photosynthesis, briefly speaking, we've talked about it. Photosynthesis means photosynthesis, synthesizing light. It's a great invention. It didn't exist for the first billion years of life. Somehow, life learned how to take the energy photons, energy packets arriving from the sun, which is 93 million miles away, and they break water apart. Remember water, H2O. Hydrogen, if you can isolate hydrogen, you can use it as a fuel. You've heard that. People talk about a hydrogen economy. The problem we have is we can break water apart, but it takes more energy to break it apart than you get back when you recombine the hydrogen with oxygen, at which point, rocket fuel, it gives off energy. But the sun can break water because it's free energy. It's arriving every day from a fusion reactor 93 million miles away. It breaks water apart. It releases the oxygen into the atmosphere. And it attaches the hydrogen to carbon dioxide and you get C6H12O6. This is what you get. You get biomass. This is the biggest living thing on earth, the General Sherman tree. It weighs 2,000 2, tons. <laughs> What's it made out of? It's made out of carbon dioxide and water. How much of that is carbon dioxide? 90%. It's a shocking fact. I, I think people should incorporate that. So the biosphere, and we're talking about 600 billion tons. That's, you know, we don't know for sure. Nobody's weighed it, but calculate. 600 billion tons of life on Earth, it appeared out of the atmosphere. It's a magic show. We're totally on a magical mystery tour, and all we have to do is wake up. <laughs> What's, so that is the trunk of the General Sherman tree. Where did it come from? It came from the atmosphere. How is that possible? What's it made out of? It's made out of carbon dioxide. It's just absurd, and it's also true. So that is the beauty of photosynthesis, which I swear to God, I will sit in my little meditation moment on the rug downstairs, and I can see a little struggling ponderosa pine tree on the dry terrace that I live on, 
And I just, I spent a little time thinking about photosynthesis, just feeling the magic of photosynthesis. I mean, what a cheap way to have fun. So ozone. Life on the planet is dangerous. It does hang by a thread. And we did do an article in the last issue called Life on a Dangerous Planet. We're lucky life survives here. It's not easy. And just simply cosmic radiations break apart delicate living cells. And if there wasn't a shield to the cosmic radiation coming from the sun and from elsewhere in space, it would destroy life on Earth. But there is a shield and it's made out of oxygen. So the oxygen that was pumped into the atmosphere by plants creates this ozone layer. It's O3, three, just three molecules or three atoms together. And for some unknown reason, it blocks part of the ultraviolet light. So it's a benefit. Um, the oxygen in the atmosphere, so there was no oxygen. There was no oxygen in the atmosphere. It's now 21, the atmosphere is now 21% oxygen. Oxygen is one of the two most highly reactive elements on the periodic table. There's 92 elements. Oxygen is super reactive. It wants to react with other elements. It would not be in the atmosphere if plants were not constantly pumping it into the atmosphere. But it's 21% because plants are. In the early, early on, 2.5 billion years ago, when the atmosphere first started to build atmosphere and water, oxygen started to build up, it reacted with iron and it created iron oxide, it's also known as rust, that created a solid. The iron mysteriously had been in solution in water. When it combined with oxygen, it created a solid which precipitated out and it made all of the iron ore deposits on the planet. So if it weren't for oxygen, there would be no iron ore deposits. And these beautiful BIFs, banded iron formations, which exist here and there all over the world, is a product of oxygen being now, photosynthesis and oxygen being pumped in the atmosphere, red beds, same thing a little later. This is sandstone in probably New, it's in New Mexico, Arizona. I forget where this picture was taken. There's not, it's like one, one half of 1% iron, but it's, which is good because it means these things won't be mined, but it turns the rocks red because it rusts because of the oxygen in the atmosphere combining with the iron in the rock. So flowers, what are flowers about? We're talking, well, we're talking largely about flowering plants. They're all about reproduction. Why are they so invested in reproduction? It's because life, the planet is constantly changing. It's so difficult for us to get used to that fact and it's painful for us. But you know, the Sears advise us, get used to it. <laughs> get used to it, don't hang on to the past even in our short lives, don't hang on to the past because it's the nature of the journey. Life's dangerous. I actually think I should skip this. Maybe I will briefly talk about it. I thought about deleting this, but you know, we have, uh, we have 23 paired chromosomes in almost every cell in our body. One, from, one of those chromosomes, of the 23, one comes from our mother and comes from our father, which is interesting that we carry our mother and father around inside of us in every cell in our body. I think maybe accepting red blood cells. When, they, when we go to reproduce and make sex cells, gametes, uh, eggs and sperm, those chromosomes double. So the, the mommy chromosome and the daddy chromosome double, and now instead of two, there's four. And then they split apart. They're no longer in one little unit, but they split apart. So every one of those 23 paired chromosomes has transformed itself into four individual ones and then they recombine independently with the other 20, 22 which have done the same thing so before there's been any sex before there's been any recombination of male and female you already have a different organism it's called independent assortment of chromosomes and they cross over if you look at that bottom picture the red one has a little blue dot on it because they just magically start sharing segments of, of the genome. And so the, the goal, apparent goal of all this is variation in the offspring. And so, moving right along here, this is a uh, seed capsule from an orchid. One orchid plant can, can have four million seeds, imagine that. How many seeds does it take to replace the parent orchids, the male and the female? The answer, of course, is two. It takes two. 
So if, if almost all of those 4 million seeds did not perish before they reproduced, the world would be full of orchids. There wouldn't be a worst thing in the world, but it doesn't happen. The world is not full of orchids, although orchids turn out to be the largest plant family on the planet. There are 28,000 species of orchids. Uh, I was surprised to learn. But the point here is that, so there's a little spiel down below about natural selection, but the point actually is that life is based on death. That most things that are born die before they reproduce because of natural selection. And, and because everything eats everything else. The only thing there is to eat is organic matter, which was something living. So, what life is constantly striving to do is to adapt to a changing planet. And the same thing, these are salmon eggs. One female salmon lays 5,000 eggs. How many of those eggs have to grow up to reproductive age and reproduce to replace the young, the parents? Two. What's going to happen to the other 4,998? They're going to get eaten by other fish, or the world will fill up with salmon, but it's not filling up with salmon. So change over time. And perhaps we could say, and this is a way that I start to wonder, I wonder if we could think about the Methow as a laboratory of evolution, that I could stay here and I wouldn't have to go to the Amazon. And you can see evolution here in the Methow as we learn about it. So it turns out that plants evolved, it's now known, plants evolved from a green algae. And sometimes green algae are now included in the plant kingdom instead of in the algae group. We have this plant in the Mahal called chara. That's it. It's in all the lakes. If you like, I've dropped a rock, an anchor in Buck Lake when we had the sixth grade camp out. And then I pull that anchor up later and it's got chara and it stinks to high heaven, but it's just loaded with chara. It's everywhere. It's in all the lakes. It's considered to be an ancestor to plants on land. Now, that char cannot live on land, so it had to adapt. But look how similar it is to horsetails. You can see the evolutionary journey, and it's not a huge leap from there to the masters of plant evolution, which are trees. Most, most of the weight of life on the planet is trees. Trees actually dominate the planet. So while this looks complicated, we'll see it twice I think and see little I chop it up so we can more easily look at it but it has interesting information and I tried to highlight it here uh, for instance I just circle plant division in the upper left these are the way plants are divided up and their evolutionary grouping so as I mentioned algae is now considered often considered a plant green algae not red algae but green algae and they're but then there's a list of plants, most of which we've heard of, some of which we don't know much about. Liverworts, we've heard of liverworts, might have a hard time. Hornworts, never heard of them. Mosses, horsetails, we've heard of these things. Cycads, I bought a cycad from Walmart. It came in a package and it lasted a year, it survived for a year and a half. I just wanted to know what a cycad was. <laughs> we don't have any. Okay, what else is in here? That's that list. It's interesting to know what the plant kingdom is made up of. This is flora of the map. How many species of these things are there in the world? I don't know why. It, oh, well, let's take one that's, well, we can look at liverworts. Second one down, there's 9,000 species. You can look this up. I didn't count them. There's 9,000 species of liverworts on the planet. It says there, uh, there might be 150 in the Mahal. 75 species have been identified. So I and others have just put the information together that various specialists have come up with for these numbers. But this is, these are some of the living organisms that live in the Mahal. So hornworts, why have I never seen a hornwort? There's only 100 on the planet. How many have been seen in the Mahal? None. <laughs> Find a hornwort, you'll be famous. Look at how many mosses there are. There's 26,000 species of mosses and about 200 in the Mahal. So I did post this chart with that other graphic from last week, which was, I can't remember. Oh, it was a stratigraphy, the names of the formations in the Mahal Valley, like Pipestone and Winthrop Formation, 
That graphic is posted at the Meho Naturalist, second item on the left. I checked it last night, it works. It opens, you can, it's a PDF, you can print it. I added this. What, you know, so what's valuable about this in particular is it show you get an idea of what's in the Met How. How many horsetails are there in the Met How? Now, actually, this is a little out of date. I mentioned that things keep changing. Horsetails, it says there's 40 in the world. I looked it up last night. Now it says there's 15 because of DNA analysis that combined them. If you want to be the world's greatest specialist in something, you should choose horsetails because there's only 15 species. And we have seven species in the Met How. Ginkgos, maybe you should study ginkgos. How many ginkgos are there in the world? <laughs> There's only one. <laughs> one, that's right. How many in the Maha? None. So the point is just getting oriented. Who lives here besides us? What organisms? There's a list. Flowering plants, I mentioned 300,000. So, you know, 1,190 flowering plants have been identified in the Maha. So we think there's more. But even, I mean, I'm a botanist, I cannot find any more plants. <laughs> George Wooten doesn't find any more plants. The list doesn't get any longer any longer anymore, but they're out there. You just have to look in, you know, you have to hang from a cliff. You have to go to difficult to get to places. So the rest of that we'll talk about when we break it down more. So here's some of these things. We talked about stonewort upper left. Look how cute mosses are, who, who knew? Uh, what are these called? Uh, these mosses on the left with the ski caps on, they're called juniper haircap moss. They're pretty common actually, and they look a little bit like a plant. I mean, they get about an inch tall, which is pretty big for a moss. When they put up their reproductive structure, they have these, these, these little hair caps on them. Aren't they cute? That's why you need a 10X hand lens. You get down on the ground and you start looking at crawling along, looking at these things. And that little hair cap, that little cap comes off. It actually comes off. And then a lid opens. I have a picture coming up of, of that sporophyte with a lid open. But here's some other liverworts. They don't seem common, but they grow in my greenhouse all the time. That very one that there's, I didn't take that picture, but they're in the greenhouse. I bet time is flying, just flying. Anyhow, have all these creatures. So this, here's a cutout version of that larger image. And it shows some of the evolutionary adaptations to life on land. Plants evolve from organism, from algae. Algae lives in water. How do algae reproduce? They have a flagellate, they have a sperm with a tail that swims through water. How's that gonna work for plants on land? <laughs> Might work for animals who can come together, plants can't move. So plants had to ditch that male gamete with, but these organisms have not managed to do it. Mosses, to reproduce sexually, the male has to swim to the female. I mean, how's that gonna happen? Same with ferns. There are ferns that are trees. Can you please explain to me how a male is gonna swim to a female? <laughs> it's a problem. Mosses, they're charming, totally charming. We have 200 species, get your hand lens, crawl around, but they're only like this when they're wet. They're like this in its early spring and in the fall, if and when it rains. They immediately turn green and start photosynthesizing and send out these sporophytes. This is a sporophyte, just to show the intricacy of all this, and it's infinite. The intricacy never ends. This is a sporophyte that has dried up. And when it dries up, the upper, upper sporophyte there has, still has a lid on it. It opens like a trap door. And then they have these teeth. And the teeth go in and out of the tank depending on whether there's high humidity or low humidity. And when they go in, they curve into the tank, they pull out the spores, and when they go out, they throw them to the wind. And this all goes on. You know, it's a magic show everywhere. All the plants have these intricate lives that we don't know too much about. Club moss, this is actually, I took this picture at home. Club mosses can get about two feet tall. My club moss at home here on my rocky, you know, this is classic mint house soil are only an inch, but they're out there. But the interesting thing about club mosses change over time. Club mosses used to be 180 feet tall. Most of the coal that we dig up from the Carboniferous period, club mosses, they used to be trees. Now they're shrunk down. So hopefully you won't shrink too much. Horsetails, horsetails, I'm sure there used to be many more species. They used to be 100 feet tall and a foot in diameter. And now there's only 15 species and they're tiny. 
although I have a very hard time keeping them out of my greenhouse, ferns. I think there's 12,000 species of ferns. That's not bad on the planet. I mean, 22 or 23 species in the meadow, but to reproduce sexually, without not with a spore, but sexually, they have a flagellated male gamete. So they're limited. They have to have water. They have to grow in wet places, except if you've been to the Big Island of Hawaii, where it blew my mind to see them growing out of the lava. <laughs> so it was a great innovation to come up with a male packet, a male gamete that did not have to swim. And conifers figured it out because they created pollen, which is male, a, male, a packet of male DNA that blows on the wind. And that's, so those are male cones on the upper left. And there's a, a mature cone in the lower right, but there's also in the, uh, hidden in there sticking up. I think I have a bigger picture here, there. That's a blow up of that same picture. That's a new cone. If you went out right now and looked on ponderosa pines, you would find these purple first year cones that have already been pollinated by pollen that blew in the wind. What's the problem with wind pollination? It's so wasteful. That's pollen on Crater Lake that just blew onto the lake. This is a picture I took from home in 2011. I thought the forest was on fire. The pollen just blows everywhere. It's totally random. What are the chances it's gonna hit a female cone? Not very good. It's not very efficient. We, life had to figure out some way to transfer the pollen from one plant to another without wasting it. Insects showed up to eat the plants. This is a picture I took at home of armyworms destroying an apple leaf. Over time, a symbiotic relationship arose and insects, I mean, armyworms still eat leaves, but many insects now transfer pollen, as you know, from the flower. That's why flowers evolve, to uh, um, attract animals, mostly insects, that will come pick up pollen and take it to another flower and another plant. But there are flowering plants that are wind pollinated. It's not just conifers. So these are flowering plants. Grasses, which are not in this picture, are flowering plants, but they're wind pollinated. Alder, birch, cottonwood, aspen, some other trees in particular are wind pollinated. It does work. And that's an interesting aspect of the evolutionary journey. Old things don't necessarily fade out. The world just gets more crowded, literally, with diversity. It gets more, the world has gotten vastly more diverse over time. So also part of the point in my mind of this slideshow are these are things to watch for. This happens in the spring. The first thing, the first sign of spring in my mind are these alder catkins. These are male catkins in the upper left. They start elongating and by March 1st, if you hit them with your finger, pollen flies out. Followed by cottonwood catkins. Those are male I think, male cottonwood catkins. They're way up high, so we don't see them. And followed by birch. These are things to watch the life unfold on the planet that's often invisible to us. Willows are intermediate. They have this wind-pollinated design of having these catkins, but they produce a small amount of nectar at the base of every catkin, and they're 50% wind and 50% nectar. Ferns appeared long ago, 400 million years ago. Conifers appeared 375 million years ago. That's a time scale on the bottom axis and diversity on the upright axis. Flowering plants appeared recently and took over the planet in terms of diversity. And it may be because they're symbiotic with animals. It may be that's what has driven symbiosis Plants have changed over time. So flowering plants, I'm circling these things. In the middle bottom, there's a circle with no X. They gave up that tailed sperm. It allowed plants to colonize the uplands of land. They don't have to live near water. It's true for conifers too, and we have plenty of conifers, but they had to learn over time. And then these other innovations, the, X, the little row of X's on the bottom line are all innovations to live on land, one of which is a cuticle. That's just a waxy surface so that they don't lose all their moisture. If you're gonna live on land, look at how it is. Look at what it's like. I mean, I'm looking out the window here. The cottonwoods are green, the conifers are green. It hasn't rained for four or five months. They're all alive because everything's covered with this waxy cuticle. 
variations. Early plants were radial, early flowers were radial. Many flowers are still radial, round like a wheel. Round flowers are pollination generalists. Any insect can land on that. It's an evolutionary journey to have become um, bilateral, bilaterally symmetrical. And these bilateral flowers and bilateral flowers are often very specific in terms of what insect knows how to pollinate these flowers. So it's something to watch for a little late in the season, but even now you can go out and look, is it a radial, is it bilateral? Who pollinates it? You can start to figure these things out. These are just examples of um, variations on designs. Most of these we have in the mat. How the upper one is a buttercup. It's radial. It has a nectary in every petal. You can pull the petal of a buttercup off and see the nectary. That's the offering to the insect. The insect sticks its tongue in there and its head hits those anthers and gets pollen all over its head, goes to another flower and delivers it. Look at these columbine. The, the nectary is, I wonder if my, maybe you can see that cursor. This is one of these uh, petals pulled off the columbine. The nectary is way back here. So all the nectaries are here. So something has, has a very long tongue to get in there. So it limits who can pollinate it. Not every insect can pollinate that. The insects have co-evolved with the flowers and some are flies have very short tongues. Bees have medium length tongues. Moths and butterflies have very long tongues. They have such long tongues that somebody found this flower growing on the island of Madagascar and anagracum orchid and its nectary was, mm, I think it's 10 inches long, the nectar bract. So the nectar is down here. So they sent it to Darwin. This was in 1862, right after he wrote that book, um, uh, The Origin of Species. And he said, well, there has to be an insect with a tongue that's 10 inches long. If it has a nectary, it's 10 inches long. And it wasn't found until the 18, 1900s. And they found this moth with a proboscis, which outlined in red. I'll take it away and you can see where it is there. It goes, it's got a proboscis 10 inches long. So these things have co-evolved. If the moth went extinct, the flower would go extinct. It's possible in reverse too. And that is a problem in the tropics where these very tight evolutionary relationships have appeared. So this is our stage brush buttercup, which is the first thing to bloom other than those alder catkins elongating in the spring, and I go looking for these things. It's a pop it's a pollination generalist. If you're gonna germinate, excuse me, if you're gonna flower early in the spring when it's cold and the insects can't fly very well, it behooves you to be a generalist. So any insect that comes along can pollinate this flower. This is Chelan penstemon. It's one of those beautiful penstemons that grows on our rocks, and it's co-evolved to be pollinated by bumblebees. And look at the fit there. It's a perfect fit. And then there's plants. I mean, there's no end to this, but and I, we're not actually addressing this. I just leave it to your imagination. The nectary is in the hood. This is monkhood. You know this flower. What and all the anthers and the all the male and female parts are in that little pile of reproductive structures, the yellow part. But the but the uh, nectar is up in the hood. So something is going to force it. So the thing is, you can start to interpret why these flowers have this shape. You can look it up. You can Google monk's hood pollination. But it's things to. Uh, what did Yogi Bear say? You can see a lot just by looking. <laughs> and something we don't think too much about are leaves, but we could. We could think about leaves. Early plants had no leaves. Leaves evolved. Leaves are the solar panels, you know, of plants. There's 300,000 species of flowering plants that all have different kinds of leaves. There's some, there's advantages and disadvantages to every leaf shape. That milk vetch, upper left, those long elongated leaves, that is one leaf. It's called a compound leaf. For some reason, it evolved to have those looks like 13 or 14 leaflets. There's some advantage to that, but there would be a disadvantage. You've lost solar, solar panel for one thing, all that empty space. So what do leaves have to do? The other, this is a snowberry, very different. It's a solid leaf. 
there are advantages and disadvantages to it. There is this chart. Actually, if I remember, I'll post this chart. I haven't done it. I'm going to cut it down so we don't see so much. But if you have a large leaf, the obvious, obvious advantage is you have up at the top there, I'm reading off of that, you have a bigger solar panel, more sunlight. A larger leaf will also overheat. You can only, photosynthesis can't, probably can't occur above about 90 degrees. You don't want the leaf to overheat. The leaf has to take in carbon dioxide. Remember that the basic building block of life is carbon dioxide. Where does it come from? It comes from the atmosphere. What are the concentrations? 413 parts per million today. <laughs> That's parts per million. <laughs> it's not that much. It just, it just has to waft in through tiny holes in the leaf called stomata. We're gonna see a picture of stomata. It helps to have air movement over the leaf. So a larger leaf reduces air movement. It, the point is there are advantages and disadvantages to every innovation in life. I'll post this so you can th think about it. You know, I didn't think of these. I had to read about them. These are stomata. They're microscopic. Every leaf is full of these stomata and they, they, they're intricate. They, they're, stomata means little mouth in probably Latin or Greek. They actually open and close according to the plant, which has no brain. How does it open and close these stomata? If it gets too hot, it can't afford to have the stomata open because it'll lose too much moisture. So they close. If it's too hot, if it's too dry, then they can't take in carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has to waft in through those holes to build the structure, any part of that plant. It's all made out of carbon dioxide. So studies have shown that with the decrease in carbon, oh, well, carbon dioxide, plants evolved at much higher levels of carbon dioxide, like 2,000 parts per million, 3,000 parts per million. With a decrease in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the number of stomata has increased, and it's shown in the fossil record. And, you know, so I just pulled up this quote. I understand it's controversial, but think of what it means to have an open mind. Think of what it means to be able to entertain different points of view and different perspectives on an infinitely variable world. The level, level of carbon dioxide went down to 250 parts per million from, this is probably 5,000, probably, it was definitely 3,000, 2,000. This guy's asking, are plants gasping for air? By which he means carbon dioxide. It's, you know, he's got a leg to stand on. It's a, it's a worthy question. So all these plants are adapted to the environment that they're in. This is bitterroot growing up above, I think this was taken up above uh, Aspen Lake. Look at, you know, the, you know the environment that bitterroot grows in. It grows only on rock piles. You're never going to find it in good soil. But the whole adaptation of the plant is, conforms with that environment. So the, these are the leaves. The leaves come out, not only did the leaves come out well before the flowers, the leaves come out in October. If you go for a rock on a walk on a rocky outcrop in the Methow next month, shockingly, this October, you'll start finding bitterroot. It blooms, and, and what are the leaves for? They're solar panels. They're photosynthesizing. They're storing energy, storing the energy of the sun. That is the beauty of it. They actually are storing the energy of the sun in the chemistry of the leaf and the roots, of course. And then as the flowers bloom, the leaves in May, the leaves dry up. And so when the flower blooms, there's no leaves. I don't know if you've noticed that. It looks like somebody threw the flowers out of an airplane. <laughs> and if you go for a walk on those rocky outcrops right now, there'll be nothing. There'll be no leaf, no flower, no nothing. The plant completely disappears. Cottonwoods on the other side are adapted to growing with their feet in water, not necessarily in a flood like that, but they only grow along the edges of our rivers and lakes. When did they put their seeds out? These cotton, the cotton, they put their seeds out on June 1st, you know, maybe May 20th to June 1st. Why? Because the river floods on May 15th and goes down and leaves um, mineral soil, wet mineral soil. Cottonwood seeds have no food. They have no endosperm. Nobody's going to gather cottonwood seeds to store for food for the winter because they don't store any energy. They only live two weeks. They come, if they don't fall on wet soil in the two, their two-week lifespan, they just die. So the cottonwoods are perfectly adapted to their environment. So it's the nature of everything. Um, everything out there has evolved over millions of years to fit into its environment. 
these are some emergent properties we don't think about, but plants are the primary source of biomass on the planet. I think down here, it says there's a thousand times more plant life by weight than animals. Plants rule the planet. Plants make all the food. Plant, animals just eat the plants <laughs> or obviously one another. Plants are a geologic force. They've sequestered billions of tons of carbon, fossilized carbon, and caused the precipitation of iron. Our fossil fuels are, are photosynthetic organisms. Fossil fuels are either plants or algae. So when we drive our car, it's the energy stored by the sun, fossil energy stored by photosynthesis. And humans evolved in trees, trees are plants. We evolved swinging from trees for 80 million years. And of course, eating plants and the use of fire is thought to be what allowed for the rapid expansion of the human brain, you know, which just grew enormously quickly over the last several million years. But it's because fire, which is burning plants, made, food, made the nutrients and food more available. This is a picture of pollen grains, a real picture of pollen grains, probably colorized. I don't know if they were that color, but this is how beautiful everything is on every level, on a microscopic level. And so this is that quote by Chardon, the purpose of evolution is to see all this beauty everywhere, beauty everywhere. And here's a little tyke going out looking for beauty. This is actually Shea Crandall, if you can believe that. <laughs> Up at Tiffany, about to go at Tiffany, you know, about... 15 years ago. But I love this quote, and I wish that I, hopefully, uh, Ari knows this, Tracy, because they're worried about, I mean, I think the young people are worried about what they're going to be when they grow up, and to me, it's like, no, life is made for adventure. What do you need for adventure? You need a sack and a old bread and some tea, and just jump over the back fence. That's all you need. Life is an adventure. That's it. So I'll post those couple of things on the NASA's website if you want to download them. And that's the end. And there's some addresses. I'm out of breath. <laughs>